subscribe button and bell icon so you never miss an update from Leela Bakore tutorial. We are now starting with another class that is Amphibia. And we will first discuss the general characteristic features and then we'll come to some specific examples. Habitat. Where do we find these amphibians? Now normally when we use the word amphi, it is for both. And from junior classes, we learn that amphibia term is given because they can live on land as well as in water. But the term amphibia is for a very specific reason. They can survive in water as well as on land, but they are dependent on water for their reproduction. So we can find them in water and land. They can live on both the regions, right? that, is, that is in water as well as on land. But some are terrestrial like toad, some are arboreal that is tree frog. They live on trees little above the ground level like hyla and the ones which live in water and on land most of the times that they are the frogs. So this is what is their habitat. We normally say that they can live in water as well as on land. So this is about the habitat. Now we'll take some specific characteristic features. Like if we talk about digestive system or what is the speciality or special features related to the digestion in case of these amphibians. Amphibians are carnivores. They're carnivorous. And the dentition that they have, that is the teeth which they have, are polyphyodont, acrodont, and homodont. Polyphyodont means many sets, so every time the teeth fall, the new set grows. Acrodont is on the basis of attachment, it is superficially attached. So on the bone, the tooth is just placed like this. So when they capture the food, the teeth may fall off and that is why they regrow. Attachment is just superficial. And homodont, that means all of them are exactly alike, slightly pointy conical structures. The next thing is about the tongue. In case of frogs or most of the amphibians, the tongue is anteriorly attached and posteriorly free. So if we draw the jaw of a frog, this is the lower jaw and here is the upper jaw, we would find that the tongue is attached here and it is slightly bifid on the lower side, posterior side. So if you imagine that this is the tongue, in our case what happens is tongue is attached at the base and anterior side is free. But in case of frogs it, has, it is attached like this. So anteriorly it is attached and posterior end is free. So they dart their tongue outside. It is very sticky and to this sticky tongue the insects get gets stuck and that those are the ones which they straight away engulf. They do not chew their food because their teeth are just to provide a grip on that food. They are not meant for chewing the food. And when we are talking about digestive system, the other end of digestive system is cloaca. That cloaca, that means it is the common opening of digestive system, excretory system and reproductive system. So this is about the digestive system. Let us talk about respiratory system. These are some general things which we are talking of. <coughs> and when we come to special examples, then we'll take up some variations if they are, are present those. Then respiratory system, in case of young, the young ones, young amphibians, the respiration is through gills. For example, in tadpole. Tadpoles respire through gills. They are aquatic 
and their respiration is always through gills. But in case of young, oh, sorry, in case of adults, the respiration can be through skin, through buccopharyngeal cavity or through lungs. So this depends when the respiration takes place by which structure. When they are in water, skin is going to help them in respiration. But when they are on land or they are hibernating or astivating, then lungs or buccopharyngeal cavity can help in respiration. So when we are talking about respiration, we'll also talk about skin. The skin is moist, glandular, and it is vascular. For any surface area to act as a respiratory area for gaseous exchange, it should be vascular so that there is blood supply. It should be moist so that oxygen can dissolve in it and the dissolved oxygen then diffuses in. And it is kept moist by those mucous glands which are present. So it, the skin is glandular, it is highly vascular and moist. So this is about the respiration. Adults respire through these three ways, but most cases young ones have gills for their respiration. And respiration through gills is known as branchial respiration. Through skin is known as cutaneous. So this is called cutaneous respiration. Through gills is called branchial respiration. And through lungs is known as pulmonary respiration. Now let us talk about circulatory system. Amphibians have three chambered heart. And this heart is a double circulation Heart, but the double circulation which is seen is incomplete. And the reason we call this uh, double circulation is, as incomplete is because it is the mixed blood which is supplied. As there are three chambers, there are two auricles and one ventricle. So auricles receive oxygenated and deoxygenated blood separately. But both the bloods, they actually come into the same ventricle. So it gets mixed up and the mixed blood is supplied to the body part. And that is why it is called incomplete double circulation. And the heart is arteriovenous heart. Arteriovenous heart. This term is used when mixed blood is supplied. We have talked of branchial heart in case of fishes. When the heart receives only deoxygenated blood, then it is called branchial heart. Here, the heart is receiving oxygenated and deoxygenated both, but they get mixed. And that is why it is the mixed blood which is supplied. So the heart is called arteriovenous heart. Then uh, related to this circulatory system, double circulation is there, arteriovenous is there, and the two accessory chambers that is sinus venosus and conus arteriosus. Both are present. So accessory chambers are also there and in the heart there are three chambers. One ventricle and there are two auricles. One more uh, characteristic feature is about exo skeleton. In case of frogs or in case of amphibians, exoskeleton is completely absent. Completely absent. You will never find exoskeleton in case of amphibians. Endoskeleton. Endoskeleton is made up of bones. 
So it is bony endoskeleton and here we'll talk about some important things. The skull is dicondylic. There are two condyles means semicircular uh, projections in the skull region which fit into the vertebral column. The vertebral column has first vertebra as atlas in which these two condyles of the skull fit but the second vertebra of the neck region in our case which is called axis is absent. Normally, the neck vertebrae, which we call the cervical vertebrae, in our case, the first cervical vertebra is atlas, the next is, the second is axis. And we have seven cervical vertebrae. Cervical vertebrae are essential when you have neck movement. In case of frog-like amphibians, the neck is absent and that is why the vertebrae are arranged in a different manner, their names are different and their numbers are also different. But Atlas is present, which is the first vertebra, in which these two condyles of the skull, they fit in. Axis, which is <coughs> the second vertebra that is absent in case of the endoskeleton part, that is the vertebral column. Exoskeleton, as we said, is always absent. Now, if we talk of one more system here, say nervous system. In case of amphibians, there are 10 pairs of cranial nerves. And when we talk of nervous system, we can also talk about sense organs. Now, eyes are present. They have bulging eyes. And the other sense organ that is ear that we talk of, they have middle ear and inner ear middle and inner ear part are present. External ear is absent, like pinna-like structure is absent. And the middle ear has only one ear ossicle. So I'm going to write it here. It has stepes only. We have three ear ossicles, malleus, incus, and stepes. But in case of amphibians, the middle ear out of three ear ossicles, only one is present, and that is stepes. So here we have compared them on uh, some characteristic features. There are a few more characteristics, uh, characteristic features which we need to discuss that we will take up now. Let us see the excretion or rather we can say it as the nitrogenous waste which is excreted. So here we are talking about excretory system not as a system but the type of nitrogenous waste which is eliminated by them. The young ones as we said they are aquatic, they are ammonotelic. So if we are talking about tadpole it eliminates the nitrogenous waste in the form of ammonia and this we have already talked of that ammonia is highly toxic. It has to be eliminated as soon as it is formed and it requires 500 milliliters of water to eliminate 1 gram of ammonia. So only aquatic organisms which are able to let that much of water go, they can excrete ammonia. So adults as they become partially or completely terrestrial, they cannot afford to lose that much of water, so they become ureotelic. Here, we'll write one ex uh, exception, that is of salamander. In case of salamander, even the adult is ammonotelic. Adult is ammonotelic. Normally, amphi adult amphibians are ureotelic. Now, next is the body temperature. They are poikilotherms. That means they are cold-blooded animals. 
and that is why to avoid extreme cold and extreme heat they undergo hibernation which is called the winter sleep and astivation which is called the summer sleep. This is an adaptation to avoid the extreme conditions because their body temperature keeps changing according to the surrounding. So if the surrounding temperature goes very low, the body temperature also starts falling. But beyond a certain limit, the enzymes become inactive and that is why they undergo this winter sleep. Same case happens in astivation that when the outer condition becomes extremely hot, the body temperature also starts rising. But at a higher temperature also, the enzymes would get denatured and to prevent the enzymes from undergoing this damage, they undergo this summer sleep. So this is because of the body temperature which is variable according to the surrounding. Now let us take this next thing is that is reproduction. In amphibians, fertilization can be external or internal. External is seen in case of frogs. So male and female, they release the gametes in the water and fertilization takes place in water. Though the release of gamete has to take place simultaneously. Whereas in case of salamander, the fertilization is internal. Now, if we talk about the development, the development is indirect and there are larval stages. Now, the most common larva that we talk of is tadpole, which is seen in case of frogs and exolotal larva which is of salamander. So larval stages are also there and depending upon which amphibian we are talking about, the larva is also given a different name. So fertilization can be external, internal and development always includes a larval stage. Now this is the general uh, discussion about some basic characteristic features of amphibians. Now in the next part, we'll take up individual examples of amphibia and we'll see some important features of those.